In this video, I want to try and talk an intuitive picture about what linear uh, angular momentum and torque mean. The way I'm going to do this is by contrasting this with linear momentum and forces. What I mean by this is you're all very familiar with uh, what happens when a car drives along a track. Uh, we have accelerations, we have forces on it, um, and everything tends to happen in one straight line. However, what happens when we have a car launched into space, say, and it orbits about the planet? Well, now we're still going to have forces acting on this, but rather than having linear momentum, we have angular momentum. And those forces act through a torque. OK, so let's get going with this. So firstly, just a reminder, um, you have in linear motion, we have displacement, which we call x. And we have a velocity, which is going to be the derivative of that, um, of that displacement. And we have an acceleration, which is the time derivative of the velocity. All of these vectors, all of these things, sorry, as you know, are vector quantities. Now, in rotational motion, we have things like angular displacement. So that means we need to set up some sort of coordinate system, say there's a theta. Um, and then we can talk about the angular velocity, i.e. how fast that theta changes with time. And we can also talk about an angular acceleration. Now, you notice here on the right-hand side, I haven't put any vector symbols. The reason for this is, in this particular talk, I'm going to focus just on the scalar quantities themselves. And in another video separately, I'll then introduce exactly what this means for, well, how we do this with vectors. OK, so the analogies we're going to draw is that in linear motion, we have linear momentum, forces, and mass. Whereas in rotational dynamics, we're going to have angular momentum, the equivalent of linear momentum. We're going to have torques, which act in a, in a, it, which have a similar function as forces, and we're going to have a thing called the moment of inertia, which has a similar function to a mass. You'll see exactly how all this comes about in just a moment. OK, so that's just a reminder. We're going to ignore vectors for now. OK, so let's take a particle um, which is rotating about another much larger particle, and all of this is, is uniform circular motion, so it happens in a plane. That means we can ignore three dimensions. We just have two dimensions. So this is the sort of picture we have in mind. Uh, this thing is, is going around like this. The tangential velocity of that particle at any moment, we're going to call v. So that means if we took a, a line um, which is tangent to the circle, uh, it, it, or, or if, for example, this was a, uh, a ball going around a string, um, and you cut that string, the tangential velocity is the velocity that that, would, that particle would have at that particular moment in time. As you can see, as it rotates, that tangential velocity is constantly changing. OK, we also can define a thing called an angular velocity. Um, so you've already seen this written as d theta by dt, but it can also be written as v over r. You can try and derive this yourself um, by just working out exactly you know, the time it would take for it to go around um, and, and a sort of distance estimate of, that, of, that, um, of the circumference of that circle. And then you will get, get to an angular velocity like this. If the particle has a mass m, then what that means is, well, OK, if it was just linear motion, uh, we would have something like this that you're very familiar with, p equals mv. But on the other hand, we know that that's not the case. We have uniform circular motion. So we need to define the angular momentum. And the angular momentum, which we label l, is given by r times p, where r is the radius of that circle. And p is its standard linear momentum. OK, we can write that as r m v. And then what we can do is we can rearrange that equation for omega, which is v over r, um, to give v equals omega r, plug that in, so we get r m times omega r. And then simplifying a little bit, we get, we get a thing called i omega. So what I've done is I've taken the m r squared term and I've labeled that to be i and called that the moment of inertia. So the moment of inertia i is equal to m times r squared for this simple system. And so the angular momentum itself is just the moment of inertia times the, um, times the angular momentum. So here you start to see one of the analogies. Um, like I was saying, uh, the angular momentum, sorry, the, the moment of inertia plays the role of a mass when we compare the L equals I omega um, equation with P equals mv, while the omega plays the role of that um, velocity, but of course it's the angular velocity in this case. OK, so one of the other things that you'll be thinking about when you think about angular momentum is a torque. What exactly is a torque? 
Well, just as a reminder, from a second ago, we have that the angular momentum is this I omega. For linear motion, we know that the force is the rate of change of momentum, so dp by dt. Um, you can write that out in it for yourself, and you, you'll convince yourself that this is just standard uh, Newton's laws. By analogy, we can do exactly the same thing for rotational motion. We can define a torque to be a rate of change of angular momentum, dl by dt. And we call that thing tau, um, this little funny t down here, um, which is the rotation, sorry, the, the torque of the system. A net torque um, will induce a change in the angular momentum. That's exactly what this equation is telling you. If there is a net torque on this system and it's positive, it will tend to increase the angular momentum. And if it is negative, it will tend to decrease the angular momentum. If the net torque is zero, the angular momentum will remain constant. OK, so going back to this, how, what, what else can we do with this? Well, OK, we also have this equation, right, which is L equals I times omega. So if we plug this in, um, um, so we have the, derivative, the time derivative of I omega, in this system, I, the moment of inertia, is just m times r squared. And we see there that the mass is going to be constant, and the r is also going to be constant for uniform circular motion. So we can take that i out the front, and we just have the time derivative of omega. And we have to remember now that omega is v over r. Well, again, r is constant, so we can pull that out. And so what we end up with is the m times r squared times a, the acceleration, or the you know, instantaneous tangential acceleration of the system divided by r. OK, simplifying a little bit, we have the r squared cancels with the r on the bottom, and we end up with r times f. So the torque is equal to the distance at which the um, force is applied times the force itself. This is something I think you'll all be very familiar with, uh, with questions about seesaws um, and things like that. But you can see it falls quite naturally out of our definitions of what angular momentum and torque were. But you'll see that we really have two ways of thinking about torque. One is the rate of change of angular momentum, and the other is the, R, the distance times the force. And these things really are equivalent. OK, I'm not sure why I had that rotate there. We'll find out. OK, uh, summary. So just as, a, as, a, as an overview, uh, overview, here we're just thinking about a particle in uniform circular motion. Uh, we're not worrying about any of the vector quantities, so we just get an intuitive picture of what all of these things are. The moment of inertia i is given in this system by m times r squared, and that plays the role of a, a kind of mass. We have angular momentum, which is i times the omega, um, and this, very much in analogy with standard linear momentum, um, talks about exactly you know, two quantities. It's the mass of the system and also how fast it's spinning around. Finally, we have a torque which is a rate of change of angular momentum, um, which can be expressed as r times f. It's also the time derivative of l. And that's very much in analogy with forces in uh, standard linear momentum, which are the rate of change of momentum. Of course, just to mention, you know, all of these equations have made some assumptions. And you'll notice that you know, we're, we're ignoring vector quantities here. We need to generalize this all to 3D. But I wanted first to give you a sort of intuitive picture. And so I'll come back to that in, in the next video.